Star Wars 7 by 7 episode 3013. Today we're going to continue our Spinner Sunday into Spinner Monday and talk about the second half of the Eye of the Storm story from the end of Phase 1 of the High Republic because it bears potentially on Phase 2 of the High Republic which really kicks into high gear starting tomorrow. Punch it! Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy, and thank you so much for joining me for it. So yes, Phase 2, Wave 1 of the High Republic Mega Ginormous Storytelling Initiative really kicks into gear starting tomorrow with Path of Deceit, that is the YA novel in the Wave 1 series of releases for Phase 2. And yes, Wave 1 is already underway, actually, with the release of the first half of George Mann's short story, New Prospects, in Star Wars Insider last month, and we are getting the second half of that this month. But I think it's fair to say that the novels are really kind of the centerpieces of the storytelling in each wave, and so, yeah, big things are afoot starting tomorrow with the release of Path of Deceit. But as Daniel Jose Older once said about the High Republic, everything is something which is kind of exciting and also kind of <laughs> nightmarish in its way because then you start reading stuff like, what does that mean? What does that mean? But as we talk about the second half of Eye of the Storm, which is the two-issue mini-mini series that was written by Charles Sewell for Marvel and takes place at the very end of Phase 1 storytelling, yeah, <laughs> there's something in there that I feel like is going to end up bearing on the storytelling that we get get in phase two. So as opposed to the first part of Eye of the Storm, which talked about ancient Evereni history, basically, and then also gave us a little bit of insight into the Roe family 20 years before the Great Disaster and 10 years before the Great Disaster, the second half of the story is much more current in terms of the phase one storytelling. It basically happens like right at the very end of phase one because there's reference to the fact that, oh, and by the way, we are in full spoiler territory, but you know, this has been out for a while. There's reference to the fact that Starlight Beacon has been taken down and Roe has plans to send corvettes to additionally pepper the wreckage to just make it harder for rescue operations to happen. But there are two very significant things that happen in this story that really end phase one with a bang. One of them has to do with the fact that they've invented this technology and these things called storm seeds, which they pepper into hyperspace, and it basically destroys any ship that is trying to enter a space where these storm seeds are. So essentially what happens is the Nile section off 10 full sectors of the outer rim. And according to Marquion Rowe, he's saying he wants to create a place where everyone is Nile and they can do whatever they want to and they're free from the Republic and from the Jedi or anything like that. So there's no way to get into any of these 10 sectors of the galaxy through hyperspace because the ships will just blow up unless they have Nile permission to enter. And of course, everyone's asking Chancellor, so what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this? And they just leave her with, you know, not saying anything. So the answer is, <sighs> I think we have to accept Nile control for now <laughs> to borrow from the Phantom Menace. So that's one of the two major developments. The other major development, and it's already mentioned, I believe, in The Fallen Star by Claudia Gray as well, but it's brought up here also is that all the Jedi are being recalled to Coruscant because they don't know what is going on with this threat that the Nile have unleashed against them that can turn Jedi into ash and completely messes with any connection to the force that they have. The Jedi don't know why they are being affected this way by these creatures. They don't know how many of them Markeon Rowe has, and they don't know where he got them from. So their whole situation is, yeah, we've got to <laughs> assemble and figure out how we're going to deal with this. Which also means that they are leaving the Outer Rim utterly undefended as well. So this is a bad scenario all around for these 10 sectors of the Outer Rim that have now been completely surrendered to Nile control. So that basically summarizes part one and part three of the story in the second half of Eye of the Storm. That's the wreckage and the triumph. But the middle part 
is called the hunt and that relates to the nameless these are the creatures that are messing with the jedi so badly and also is the thing that potentially bears on what we're going to see in phase two of the higher public storytelling it has to do with a story where Marcion Rowe, Marcion Rowe, manages to convince a bunch of Nile to go to a planet which is also <laughs> left nameless, but instead of having a typical atmosphere, it has something that's referred to as the Veil, and Marcion basically needs to sacrifice a bunch of people in order to get to the surface of this planet. So the Veil acts as an immune system instead, and so as different ships approach it, it basically attacks those ships, and while it's busy attacking those ships, Marcion, Marcion, however you want to pronounce it, gets slips in through the veil and is able to get to the surface of this planet. And once he gets to the surface with a bunch of Nile, he activates this device which seems like it might be the same thing that he used to control the leveler in the rising storm that killed Loden Greatstorm and caused everybody to freak out in the first place. And the planet itself seems to react to it and one of the Nile says like, is everything here going to try to kill us because of this? And Marky and Rose's answer is, yeah, so don't let him. So it just becomes this crazy brawl until the nameless creatures finally come having heard the call of this beacon device that Marky and Rowe has activated. And so the Nile are able to gather up these creatures and put them in restraints and bring them onto the ship and then escape with a few other Nile survivors. Now, we don't know how many Marcion was actually able to catch, and I have a feeling that, you know, some sort of breeding or cloning is probably going to happen <laughs> as a result of this, so he can have as many of them as he can possibly get. Because if you're going to go <laughs> to the trouble of corralling some nameless for use against the Jedi, I mean, I think based on everything that happens, I think you only want to have to go through that once if you have to go through it at all. But anyway, Roe in the narrative says that the location of the this place has been passed down through his family for generations and we find out through that and through discussions with some of the Nile that survive that Rose's family was associated with an attempt to use these creatures against the Jedi many years ago and the Jedi have suppressed knowledge of these creatures in the galaxy and this is also part of why Ro is looking for revenge against the Jedi. And it's that bit about him saying the Rose were connected to an attempt to use these creatures a long time ago. That's the thing that makes me think, oh, we're probably going to see something about that in Phase 2 of The High Republic. And just for hypothetical sake, we have no idea how long the average ever any lifespan is, and we don't know about generations or anything like that. But if we roll with an average of 25 years for a generation and an average 75 year lifespan, maybe, then we actually have to go back five generations from Marquis on Row in order to get to this era of the High Republic phase two. So if Marta Rowe, for example, is a direct ancestor of Marcion Rowe, then Marta would have to be his great, great, great grandmother. And that means we ought not to see anybody from the Rowe clan who appeared in phase one showing up in phase two of High Republic storytelling. Maybe the birth of Shala Rowe, who would be Marcion's grandmother, like toward the end of phase two storytelling. But yeah, I think the only people that are in phase one that we could possibly see in phase two overall are Yoda and Porter Engel and maybe a couple others but yeah it's going to be few and far between in terms of characters who could appear in both phases of the storytelling. So there you go that in my humble opinion is what I think might be worth paying attention to from the second half of the Eye of the Storm mini mini series and what we might want to keep an eye on for how it plays with phase two. And that is going to do it for this episode of the podcast. So it just remains for me to say thank you so much for joining me for it, as always. And may the force be with you wherever in the world you may be. Star Wars 7x7 is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited by their respective trademark and copyright holders. May the force be with them. All original content is copyright 2021 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.